We have Reiner Blatt. And Reiner will speak about quantum information processing and quantum error correction with trapped calcium ions. Thanks very much, Mike. Good morning, everybody. And after this beautiful talk about the theory of quantum information processing and error correction, uh, I'll have to talk to you about the gory details of reality. Sorry for that. And uh, this is about one implementation we do in Innsbruck with trapped ions. And you see here the workhorse. I'm going to talk about that a little later. So what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, I would like to make you familiar with how, the way, with how we use trapped calcium ions for quantum information processing. Then I'll talk about the coherence of multiparticle entangled states and what the error sources really are. Finally, we delve into the procedures, how to do quantum error correction with trapped ions. I'll show you also a first measurement uh, and undo by a quantum error correction and uh, how we then apply these things later on, at least to quantum simulations, that's what we intend. All the work uh, is happening at the University of Innsbruck and uh, uh, at the Austrian Academy of Sciences Institute. And of course, here we have a number of sponsors who make that possible. Just to give you the layout of the experiment, we are using a pole trap, a linear pole trap of this kind. So we have these four knife edge plates, and uh, then we have these, uh, uh, these linear, the, these, uh, the, these tips. Uh, we apply radio frequency potential and DC potentials to confine ions in the center. Then we radiate them with laser light, they fluoresce, and then we can see that with the CCD camera. Also, we can join in uh, uh, an addressed laser in order to manipulate the individual qubits. So usually the picture that we see when we do the experiments is a chain like that. In this case, it's eight ions. And the, the distance between those ions is about a few, it's a few micron. And it's a, this and that's about four micron right here. The system at hand that we have is a uh, calcium ion. And the two-level system that we are invoking is actually uh, realized with a state, with the, with the D5 half state right here, which has a lifetime of about one second. All the other lasers are uh, necessary in order to manipulate the, uh, the ion uh, at will and to scatter fluorescence that we see this. And the light that you saw on the previous slide is scattered at 397 nanometers. Now, of course, you know that there is nothing like a real two-level system, so we have to do this. And if you just place this in a magnetic field, and according to the quantization axis that we apply, we have these three transitions available that are indicated in red. This one is most sensitive depending on the magnetic field. That's this one, the strong one. Therefore, we use it only for sideband cooling, but not for quantum state processing. Whereas this is the least dependent. That's why we use that in the spectrum for quantum state processing. So this is the one that we single out, which goes from the minus 1 half to the minus 5 half, uh, minus one right here. Fluorescence detection happens in such a way that we shine in that laser light, as indicated before. And once the system is in that D5 half state, we don't see the light. Otherwise, we see the light. And that's the big asset in ion traps that we use for quantum information processing because you get a unique signal-to-noise ratio. Once the atom or the ion in this case is projected at this state, so you won't see the light, and uh, then this uh, uh, shows up uh, by, by in itself as uh, this, these famous quantum jumps. And uh, just drawing a histogram, you show that prior to a measurement and you don't see anything, the D state was occupied, and you hear it when you see the light, then of course the S state was occupied and the computer can draw a line and you can easily detect that with nearly 100% efficiency. Now, what is the toolbox that we have? We have a number of uh, operations available, and I can't go through all these details here, but let me give you the most recent toolbox that we have, a collection of those. Most importantly, it's the entangling uh, operation that's of the Mermesurance. The Mermesurance operation relies on two photon transitions that in a super Bloch sphere connect, the, say, both ions in the ground state, SS, with both ions in the, in the excited state, that's the D state, but you see, when you shine in laser light, there's uh, various ways to reach this via two photon transitions. Uh, because we are residing in a trap, then there's a harmonic oscillator structure always uh, added to that. So we have to shine in laser light, for example, to that lower sideband, as we say, it's going to uh, short of, uh, by one phonon right here. And we can add to this a blue sideband. But there are four different settings, uh, four different uh, amplitudes that cont contribute here. And what Mirma and Sorensen showed some time ago is that they conspire in such a fact that the intermediate states first order cancel. So in other words, the dependence on the quantum number n in creating, say, a superposition of SS and DD, which is an entangling operation, vanishes. Like, uh, likewise, since we are applying radiation uh, symmetrically, experimentally, we don't have any stark shifts 
to compensate for, and so the system is fairly insensitive with respect to stock shifts. To sum up, these memosurins gates generate GHC states of that kind, and uh, that realizes essentially a two-body Hamiltonian where you have interactions in this, of this kind, so where every ion interacts with every other ions, for example, written down here for three ions. But for the different phase notation, this could also be an X instead of a, a, a Y instead of an X rotation. So this is uh, always possible. This is the entangling operation that we have. Now, tuning the laser on resonance, this global laser that interacts with all systems and just having one radiation here, then, of course, resonantly manipulates that two-level system that we have. And note that we just call the excited state a zero and the, uh, and the ground state a one. That's just for technical and historical reasons. Because, uh, this is the bright level and this is the dark level, so this is zero and this is one. But with the resonant manipulation, we just do single bits of this kind, so we just can uh, create superpositions, say, for instance, the plus minus states and so forth, uh, simultaneously on all of these three ions. And third, uh, we have an addressed operation where we have these individual lasers detuned now of resonance, and they create stark shifts. So they make operations of the sigma C type right here. And with this, we can create all kinds of signs, sign changes in this. Uh, in, 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 in this, uh, these operations. These three operations, I'll come back to that a little later, provide an overcomplete set uh, for universal operations. We can realize virtually everything, mm -hmm. and it's not so easy to figure out what's the right way to do that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, uh, thus, just to sum up uh, experimentally, we can do this with very high fidelity, uh, all of these single and collective operations with 99%. We have demonstrated the memos operation for two lines with 99.3% so the high fidelity operation. Usually when we work with more four or five ions, this is uh, on the order of about 98%. So this is uh, going down a little bit, but nevertheless, it's still a high fidelity operation. So let me just uh, show you again how this works. Suppose you have a two-level system right here and a two-level system right here. They all talk to each other by the common mode, the center of mass motion in this case, as indicated here, by the harmonic oscillator ladder. And uh, this, as said before, uh, leads to an effective spin-spin interaction. This can be easily extended to many ions because all of these ions share the center of mass motion and they're talking the same way to each other. So in other words, y the, you get that effective spin-spin interaction uh, between all of those ions. And with this, as I said before, you can create the GIC states. And the pictorial way, these are again the, uh, the, the graphs that we have for the transitions. If you start from SS, you create the Bell state as indicated right here. Uh, if you have, say, four ions, then, of course, there's many more amplitudes that's conspired to, to give you that GSC stuff. Or for eight ions, uh, here you see this is a very powerful operation. This is a very powerful operation that simultaneously really leads to entanglement, all of these things, in a single pulse. And that now enables us to make many of the operations, uh, many of the procedures that uh, we do, uh, that, that I'll show you later on. So let's get started. For example, we did these GHC states. GHD states are the most sensitive to uh, states because they're highly correlated to every perturbation. And if you really want to, 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 to think about the errors in your system, if you want to know what are the errors, the best way to do this is go for the most sensitive states and just check out how long they live. So for example, we create here, for comparison, a single line Ramsey fringe. These are all parity measurements. So for example, for two ions, this goes twice as fast, three, four, five to eight ions. And here are the fidelities that you can readily derive from Dutch parity measurements. We can go as high as, as 11 ions. And here I just uh, wrote down a different way of measuring the entanglement. This is uh, uh, the, the, the different way uh, by uh, entanglement witnesses to check out whether we have still entanglement. And here, even for 14 ions, we have entanglement, uh, 49 entanglement by 17 standard deviations. So this shows you that you can create such large states. Now let's see how they are uh, affected by errors. How long do they live? And we created them, measured what the amplitude is, immediately after creating them, then wait, and just uh, uh, do that the same thing again. And here is the raw data. And this is fitted in a semi-logarithmic uh, plot with a Gaussian curve. As an experimentalist, you just do that first hand and see what, what, what's happening here. And you see that immediately, starting from a single line Ramsey contrast, which uh, goes on for many milliseconds right here, you immediately start to lose your contrast. If something is working on the ions, something's causing errors. 
And what is that? Now, we immediately realize that apparently, here in our system, since we are setting a quantization axis with the magnetic field, we have a fluctuating current. So there's a common fluctuation in the magnetic field that causes a common dephasing. Not necessarily decoherence, but a dephasing. And that dephasing, that uh, uh, works simultaneously to all ions. And we try to understand that in more detail. And here you see actually the measurements which shows you that this is really caused by the magnetic field because these transitions are five times uh, uh, different in their sensitivity with respect to the magnetic field. You see that fivefold uh, sensitivity immediately present in the coherence measurement in this, uh, in the, in this state. But back to the model. So we just take our Hamiltonian right here and think about uh, varying magnetic fields and how this influences our spins in our system right here. Now we try to calculate the fidelity of these states and we make ensemble averages and uh, together with Bill Koch from uh, IQC, or we measured, we, we developed that uh, uh, model and I don't have the time to go into the details, but it shows you that due to the fluctuations of the magnetic field, which are of, na of technical nature, we have for very, for, for short times we have a Gaussian nature, but for long time behavior, this is governed by the correlation function of the magnetic field that you have to measure. And here's the measurement of that correlation function, which looks a little funny. This is exponentially decaying. However, it has a, an oscillatory component. That component comes from the fact that you have to servo the current, of course, to make sure that it's stabilized and that there's a servo bump. Once we saw that, of course, we could really make this a lot better. But it seems to sort of to agree with the measurements what we derive from the error model. And we did a lot more work on that. And to make a long story short, here is again the same data that I presented you before, but now fitted with a model that we came up with. And you see that we can really quantitatively the decay of these GSC states in terms of that noise of the errors that we have. And this is mostly stemming from the magnetic field. Uh, this is a little tricky because there's also, uh, this is hard to, hard to distinguish, experimentally we can do that, there's also an error by laser frequency noise. Remember that state has a lifetime of one second, so we apply a laser with a bandwidth of one hertz. There's phase noise. And if the laser bandwidth goes up to 10 or 20 hertz, we'll already see this. And uh, so sometimes we have to make sure that we are not limited by laser noise. In any case, even laser noise would also lead to collective uh, defacing. So we see that the relative error probability here scales with n squared, unfortunately for those uh, GHC states. But this is due to the fact that we have collective noise or correlated noise, in this case, what sometimes also coined super decoherence. So the coherence of a GHC state would be affected by that fact. But here, of course, we deliberately made a GHC state that was most sensitive to this magnetic field fluctuation because we want to know that. You want to know. The, the, the correlations, you want to know the, the noise and the error. Know thy enemy before you do error correction. And that's the point. When you just now apply the state in a different way, you start with a symmetric state right here. So you create a GSC state where half of them pointing up and the other half point down. Then, of course, they work opposite to each other. That's a decoherence-free subspace with respect to the magnetic field. Then, of course, you don't get that. So the coherence time is as long as it is allowed by the spontaneous emission within the error limits right here. So for example, when you now look for the decay, that is more like 300 milliseconds. And this is uh, what the decay time really is in this case. Even that could be protected for. So we could just uh, add another pulse and go to the ground states. So we know that for a long time and we've, had, we've used that. So in fact, we want to use long coherence times and want to protect these things. Then we can just hide things in the ground states and just encode the system in such a way so we have lifetimes of the entanglement more like 20 seconds. So this is known. We just wanted to know what is the technical limitation and what do we have to do for short times to overcome this before we uh, st uh, step into error correction. But just a side remark right here. Uh, the idea that uh, I pointed out here by just using the ground states and maybe two S and S prime states, the two Seyman states, just lends itself to encoding things in a, even a decoherence for subspace with respect to magnetic field in the ground state. So here you would use, say, four qubits instead of two and encode a logical qubit in two of those. So for example, by going to the logical, L, logical zero in SS prime, logical one to S prime S. And then we still have the addressability here and we could simultaneously address the both innermost ions and that's what we have done. We trade off the factor of two more ions but from extended coherence times. 
and you just have to figure out now all the gory details to make a gate operation. To make a long story short, yes, you can do that. So we made the first experiment to make a real logical gate operation in the decoherence-free subspace some time ago, and this is the full tomography um, uh, process matrix, process tomography matrix that gives you a f mean fidelity of 89%. Not perfect, but uh, I think this can be improved on, and it shows that all of the tools that we have are uh, applicable to these things and can be used for that. Okay, so let's uh, remind ourselves of all the fidelities that we have and the three operations. Now we are getting closer to what we actually want to do. Here's our operations. Could be SY squared, SX squared, and the individual gates, and things like that. But this is an overcomplete set. And uh, the question really is how, and you're back to the algebra. Thank you, uh, Danny, uh, Manny, uh, for this. Uh, now the question really is, what is the, the appropriate choice of the operations to make a certain algorithm work? This is now, it's not unique, because you have very, very many pulses possible. And for this, we uh, tried to uh, investigate this some time ago. But we use now quantum optimum control methods. So for example, we just write down our Hamiltonian piecewise, uh, piecewise uh, way right here in such a way that we just try to present our gate operations by a time-ordered sequence of these applications of these operations. And here, uh, in a quantum optimal control, you just use a procedure. In this case, we just used the grape algorithm here by Kanija. We made reference to that one. But we restricted ourselves, ourselves not to do simultaneous applications of several Hamiltonians. We just do this as indicated here, piecewise and time-ordered. And we have sequence of pulses with variable length. We do not allow, allow for arbitrary amplitudes, as very often done in NMR technology. In fact, we just, uh, let me just come back, we just, we, re we, we limited ourselves to minimal pulse lengths of pi over 8. This can be argued, but uh, we can come back to that in the, in the discussion. So, for example, if you realize, we want to realize now a quantum Toffoli gate, uh, usually this would have to be realized with more like six C0 gate operations and a few local operations. This can be done now by uh, this implementation where these collective gates, these are Mermes Sorensen, so this is only three Mermes Sorensen and three local operations. It's less than half as long as what you would do with ordinary C0 gates. And uh, now let's just come back to the error correction part. If you want to do error correction, and you've seen that now several times, then of course we have the encoding step, then the error may happen, and then you have the syndrome detection and the correction with the Theotophilies. You reset uh, the ancillas right here, and you start over again. So this is the primitive that we really wanted to realize. Of course, now, the idea is, if you do this in a complete way, then this is actually a unitary. And we wanted to use now our procedure to come up with a unitary that exactly does this. So for example, if you, this is the, how the procedure goes. If you just come up with an optimized pulse sequence, this looks like indicated here. I can't give you an intuitive uh, idea why this is this and not other way around. This is the, the output of a computer. And it's not unique. We could come up with, with similar uh, results which are slightly longer, slightly shorter, whatever. This is one of them. And this is, I think this is the shortest that we found, invoking only pi over 8 pulses. We didn't want to get any smaller for some technical reason. And I think this is good enough. So let me just show you now how we do this. In fact, we make it even simpler because we really didn't want to start out with five ions, but only with three ions to begin with, because uh, it's too, too many things to control otherwise. If you start with ions, then these are the, the, you have to do this in a, in a somewhat different way. Again, there's the encoding. The error can happen here. The decoding phase, and you just have one Toffoli. But you have to reset now your ancillas. But in order to start over again, of course, you have to re-encode the system. Otherwise, you could just repeat things over and over again. But now you have to re-encode. That's the, that's the drawback. And this, of course, then leads to errors in addition. But let me just show you what we did. OK. But we wanted to correct for phase errors, because remember, the magnetic field causes mostly dephasing. It's not bit flips that we are encountering. It's mostly dephasing. So we just have to use Hadamard's in addition right here, all, of the, all these places. Now, in order to give the computer some leeway in order to find the optimal optimal sequence. We allow for, say, a, a, a dummy operation D, or uh, the inverse of D, that simpl simplifies encoding, uh, then uh, which, is, which commutes with the error, for example. We don't care about that. We just leave the computer that leeway. 
And also because we have to reset the ancillas anyway, it doesn't really matter whether we just include here another arbitrary unitary operation. So that could be there as well to, for the computer to optimize. This is degrees of freedom. When you do that, then out of this sequence, the computer comes up with that modified grade algorithm with a very tiny sequence. The first one is intuitively clear. The encoding right here is nothing but encoding into a GHC state. But as I told you before, the Mermoserensen gate operation does exactly that. So it's just one pulse of this Mermoserensen uh, gate. Uh, just note that we start with the one ancilla in, ancilla in, one in the ground state, but that's just a technical uh, point here. Then the error can happen. And here I don't have an intuitive picture of what that does. But in the end, you come up with only three Mermoserensens and uh, four uh, global operations and one local operation only a few hundred microseconds long, this goes very, very fast. Then, we, of course, we have to reset the ancillas. That's the point that we still have to do. And this is where you take the entropy away. So you just have to take that out of the system. How do we do that? Remember, the one is the ground state, and the excited state is the zero. <coughs> and now everything is encoded here between one and, uh, and zero. That's the superposition. When we want to reset the ancillas, we do first the following. We just shelve the amplitude or the, the, the population of that state down to the S prime state down there. Then we apply a laser pulse. We just repump these things to the S state. So we just reset that ancilla completely. And then we just go ahead with the system. So the system is really, again, prepared in state one as indicated. This is the reset pulse. It's optical pumping. And we have to worry a bit about the, the heating that is present because it could very well be that during the fluorescence, since not only happens on this day, it could go back and so it could shuttle back and forth several times, that it might scatter on a sideband that creates a phonon in the motion. However, just analyzing this, we know we just get about 0.014 or 0.14 phonons per reset, and we can live with that because the Mermoserensen operation is first order independent of that. So we are ready now. We have our information, it's encoded, and uh, it's, uh, this is how we start. So we encode our information right here. In uh, GHC state, the error may happen. Then we correct for the error, and then we repeat all over again. And the entire sequence then looks like that. So we have just uh, three times in a row these, uh, the, 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 this, this procedure, which is consisting of that, and then finally realize that this pulse sequence, and that is, as you saw before, the reset operation. What are the results? First of all, we want to make sure that, of course, we do see uh, an identity. If we don't do anything, we should get our identity with a high uh, probability. And here is always drawn the process tomography. So this is identity, identity, this is x, y, and z in the Pauli notation. So we just here retrieve our identity after doing nothing with 97%. Keep in mind, we're always limited uh, with the preparation steps and some gate operations that we need, you know, encode and decode uh, with, without doing any errors, so that the identity is fine. If we just have now uh, one step, so we just introduce single qubit errors only. The single qubit errors can be induced by just randomly shining in that laser on one, either one, uh, first, second, or third qubit. And we just make uh, then uh, a, a phase error in the same kind we are, as I've shown you before. And that phase error that uh, is now applied randomly to all of these, and we make an error correction. And then we ask ourselves, how well do we retrieve this, this system? We, if we don't do errors, it's 90%. With errors, it's also 90%. The error correction seems to work fine. It's just the preparation and anal analysis that uh, doesn't, where we lose the fidelity. Likewise, when we re repeat this a second time, it's 80% with and without errors. And the third time, it's the same thing within our error limits. So we can actually claim that procedure that we've come up with perfectly corrects for all these errors. It is just so that we lose the fidelity in all the preparatory and ana analysis steps that we have in the system. And this can be summarized here with a slight catch. Here is the process fidelity drawn as a function of the error probability. And what I didn't tell you so far, we have to make the, how, the, how, we did, how we did make the errors. If we just wait, then you keep in mind there were these correlated errors. So just waiting, increasing the waiting time, then we increase the LED, gives you the green curve right here. That's correlated noise. 
correlated noise has a much higher probability to get two, photo, uh, two, uh, two bit errors instead of a single qubit error. And that's drawn here. If you calculate the probability for having is it two qubit errors as a function of the error probability, this is the green curve right here. You can measure actually that. However, we wanted to know, does this really correct for, it's a single qubit correcting code. Can we correct for single qubit errors? And this is what we wanted to do. So we had to introduce single qubit noise. That single qubit noise, I'll show you that in a minute, was introduced here. And uh, aside from all the preparation and analysis uh, errors, then we get really sort of a break even. In this area, we are getting better with that error probability than what we had before. Unfortunately, the system is not there yet because we still have that correlated noise and we have to do something about it. And uh, that's all I have. Is there a procedure to correct for correlated noise or not? And so, so we have to think about these things. But just to give you an idea how we actually introduce this, the, this uh, uncorrelated noise. And here, we just make use of the fact that you can just project the state with probability P, P, P prime and interpret this as phase damping. It's just a projection of the C-axis. And this is sort of a phase noise that you have here. And uh, so we apply for this just to the qubit, which is encoded right here, for a very short amount of time with a variable intensity, uh, just a pulse here, which just spoils that part. And uh, then that introduces the necessary noise. But this can be done now in a, in a stronger way, too. Let me just show you. For example, we can encode, and then we could hide, for example, the qubits that actually encode our protect or protected information right here. And here, we just could apply now more radiation. In fact, we could actually apply a quantum jump sequence in order to see whether we uh, project the system in the ground state or in the excited state. We, you see, this is the histogram that we had before. Once we don't see any light, the system was in the excited state. If we see the light, the system was here in the ground state. And now, if we do that, and our system works fine, and to keep in mind, that projection is just the projection along the c-axis. So we interpret that as a full, fully defaced system. Then we should be able to resurrect the system. We should be able to undo a measurement. And this is exactly what happens when we just make that, and uh, then we find the system uh, with process tomography in either the D or the S state. So we get that result with nearly 79% and 74%. The, the fidelity here is slightly higher because when the system is here, you scatter light here and the system doesn't change very much. But when you, the, the system is in the S state, you scatter a lot of fluorescence and it could be that the system is heated up. And in order to, 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 to suppress that, what we did is we just uh, used a recooling during the time we measure to make sure that the system stays in the lowest uh, phonon states. If you don't do that, uh, you suffer from that, and in the S state you find only a fidelity of 50%, whereas the rest works only. This is just the first result of last week. Uh, of course, we are trying to do this much better, but it shows you the power that we can actually have with this error correction, and um, if somebody would have asked me 15 years ago, I can undo a quantum jump, I would have laughed because a quantum jump is really uh, the prototype of a destructive measurement. And for this, I think this is a nice demonstration that these things really work. So let me see. How much time do I still have? Like, tell me. Wonderful. So let me see where we can use this for. And I would like to show you in the end a few applications that we are currently working on and where we really want to quantum, correction, quantum error correction protocols. And this is First and foremost, quantum simulations, where the goal, of course, is that we want to simulate the physics of a system with another one that's easier to control and to measure. Of course, we need to be able to engineer the interactions and to measure the relevant observables. And as you've seen, and I hope I convinced you, that trap ions are yet small but reliable quantum systems, where we have, of course, qubits, but also continuous variables. This is the uh, harmonic oscillator degree of freedom, where we have excellent control and excellent measurement capabilities. Now, there's two ways with which you can do quantum simulations. And usually, we uh, do this in, in an analog and a digital fashion. The analog approach, the analog quantum simulation, is in such a way that we try to engineer a Hamiltonian exactly matching the system Hamiltonian. So we are trying to reinterpret the parameters that go into the Hamiltonians in such a way that we match these things nicely to what we have at hand with our systems, uh, with, with our toolbox. 
So for example, you can do this in optical lattices as well. Now there are many experiments on the way, or in iron crystals, there are also several experiments on the way where you have these, uh, uh, these strings of ions. But there's another way. You can actually do also digital quantum simulations. And the digital quantum simulation actually is using now a sort of a, a full-blown quantum computer. You use the circuit model in such a way that you decompose the dynamics induced by the system Hamiltonian into a sequence of quantum gates realized piecewise again by these unit, uh, unitaries. And of course, these unitaries eventually have to make up for the, uh, um, for the system Hamiltonian that is to be simulated. But this is comprised of parts that not necessarily commute with each other. If that's not the case, then we can make use of this Trotter formula so we can piecewise apply these things and just uh, approximate better and better and better the, the system. Of course, in the end, that's not something we haven't done yet, you would have to apply quantum error correction to go for very long sequences to make sure that these things really survive. But this is another story, but you see how the story comes together in a minute. So let's just uh, try to do this. I, since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to talk about this analog things. Let me just show you the digital some stuff here. So remember, for the digital quantum simulation, we really want to use now the circuit model as it is here. And we have the system register. And our toolbox, as indicated, are, again, the addressed uh, single qubit gates or the entangling gates. There's nothing else. Of course, we have the other toolboxes available. And uh, we just run all these things through our optimizer, sort of an optimizing compiler for the pulses. And then we just apply that. So let me just give you the primitives of the algorithm. Suppose we have now written down a system Hamiltonian that we really want to, mod, uh, want to implement and piecewise. Then we just try to encode this. And we just realize local unitaries uh, and the local evolution for that. Then we approximate the global evolution by having the Trotter formula right here. And I've just replaced here this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this with phases. So I just talk about phases now instead of all these, uh, these energies. So the idea essentially then is to realize all of these individual uh, unitaries, again, with the toolbox that we've had before, because we can do arbitrary unitaries. And then identify them and apply them over and over again n times until we finally get then the result. That this is efficient for local quantum systems was pointed out by Seth Lloyd in 1996 in that paper. So now let's just try to, to realize this. As a toy model, we started out with the two-spin easing system. And uh, the two-spin easing system, as known for you, just shows you the dynamics of these uh, the two spins right here. And we are usually just varying that ratio of, this in, uh, of, the, of the interaction and the, 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 the energies right here. So let's just see how we implement that. If you write down now the unitary, you realize this is uh, an effective spin-spin interaction. And this is just a sigma c interaction, as indicated right here. Now, we know how to implement that. This is the Milner Sorensen gate, and this is clearly one of our AC star gates. So of course, we have really now used our operations that we have in the toolbox to make these things. And the dynamics that we wanted to simulate here is, for example, now just the spin-spin interaction. We want to see how often does the, the spin point up when we just uh, uh, evolve this in time. If we break this down in pieces like this, then we get a very bad uh, agreement right here. So this, these are the ex experiments, and the fidelity is only 69 case. When we make this smaller and smaller, the fidelity increases. And finally, when we get finer and finer, so the system evolution is nicely described by this uh, uh, <coughs> simulation. But once we demonstrate this, we can do a lot more. We can do systems um, uh, simulations of two spin, three spin, and larger than two spin simulations. But of the, of the various kinds, we can just using different kinds of easing models. We can Heisen use Heisenberg models. We can use uh, n-body uh, systems. You name it, we can do it. And just to give you a few examples right here, as we uh, implement this, the easing, again, that's uh, the measurements in the global AC uh, Stark effect. XY model, for example, would be another Milner Sorensen because that would be re replaced by the spin spin in the y direction. Or XYZ model. So this can also be done by sandwiching, let's say, Milner Sorensen in between two uh, sigma C operations or carry operations right here. And in all cases, abilities that are close to 80%, and it shows that the system evolution can be described as we want to have it. 
But we can do even more, which is not easily available in many other things. So the toolbox is now extending, and that's what I wanted to convey to you as theorists who may want to know what, can you, what else can you do. We can do many-body operations. Effective three-body Hamiltonians can be realized, for instance, by sandwiching a Mermer operation with one of these AC uh, star effects. So this is half a Mermer Sorensen, pi over four, right here. And uh, this realizes effectively that sigma c, sigma x, sigma x uh, operation. And then you can study some interesting dynamics. So for example, when you apply this to three ions and have an AC stark shift in between, as indicated right here, then you can, gener you can generate a GHC state of that kind. And you see the parity flops right away with a very high fidelity, where we here measured fidelity bounds by a method of Holger Hoff Hoffmann. But you can even do more. You can actually make an effective spin interaction and create a six uh, state, a six uh, GIZ state immediately. The fidelity is not as good, as clearly, but uh, it, it just shows you that the toolbox is now really extended. And what I would like you to do as theorists to come up with a procedure for me to, or to tell me what is the optimum sequence to use all of these powerful tools to do the operations. Because we have these gate operations that are much more powerful than the simple gate operations that we have so far. So let me conclude with a few things here. Uh, what we really want to do, this just shows you what we can do with four ions, for example. We want to study the time-dependent dynamics. The frequencies, of course, can uh, tell us the spectrum, so we can make the Fourier transform and see the gaps in the system, whatever. Eigenvalues can be extracted. We have a number of limiting error sources, intensity fluctuations, which can be uh, corrected for in different ways. But of course, there are other errors, and here we need error protection in decreasing free subspaces or active error correction, as I've shown. And we are trying to combine these systems right now. Which brings me to the end of my talk. I've shown you all of these things. Let me just stress what, I, what we want to do in the future. Of course, we want to further optimize all these things. We want to go on with error correction protocols for five qubits, different encoding. And we further want to implement logical qubits and to make sure that we can scale these things up for, that require some technology. But after all, I have a dream. And let me convey you my dream. We are working on long strings like this and then do all the technical things. But my real dream is this one. For a number of reasons, not so much for number crunching, I want to keep a qubit alive. Suppose that happens. You have a two-level system. That two-level system is affected by a path or by a measurement or by anything else. You don't care. You have an error correction procedure, and you resurrect it all the time. That's the perfect spinning top. That's the perfect local oscillator for all G reasons. That's what I want to have. And this is what I want to realize before I retire. This is my dream. And there's all other things that just come from that. There's a number of applications in quantum metrology, quantum information processing, quantum simulations, quantum computation, lots of these things. But they all rely on this. And that's where my dream goes. And here are the people who helped me realize this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Reiner, for a very nice talk. Any questions from the audience? So thanks for a really nice talk. So you have C0 gates at the 98% fidelity level. Yes. To the best of my knowledge, that's the highest fidelity C0 gate that anyone has yes. in the world. With your 14 qubit system, you actually only need 10 qubits fault tolerant fully fault tolerant quantum error correction code. I'm not so sure I understand that. With my 14 qubits, we have well, only... Well, you, do, you, you don't need all 14. You can do it with 10. So there seems to be the potential to start considering doing a fully fault tolerant quantum error correction protocol That's right. with your existing yeah. system. No, I understand your question, yes. So it would be great to just talk about trying to get that working, because you also have, of course, all these other tools to play with. So yeah, if I can catch you afterwards, that would be good. Absolutely. Other questions? I have a question about your control sequences. So in those sequences, you were doing one pass after another. Yes. And uh, can you do passes simultaneously, and can you have varying uh, intensity during a pulse, and would that give you additional that would knobs give to play with and shorten it your does sequences and further? It, it, it's used. The, we are not using simultaneous pulses. 
Simultaneous responses are easily doable if you're operating on the carrier, things that do not affect the motion of the ions. But once you do simultaneous things that affect the motion on the ions, that is very tricky. I've tried to study this uh, numerically, and uh, that led me nowhere. If you have a, an idea how to, to figure that out, that's fine. But so far, this is uh, numerically, this is a nightmare. Uh, and uh, amplitude-wise, your question is, we, of course, are doing uh, pulse shaping. So we use Blackman pulses to switch on and off. And there's lots of these things. It probably doesn't give us any, it would probably, maybe I'm wrong, but I do not think that we can win a lot by, say, making a special amplitude shape of certain pulses. But even that could be done, because in the end, it doesn't care. We have a toolbox. If I have a bit more complicated toolbox in a certain operation, where I have, say, an amplitude modulated wave for the single pulse, so what? I can easily pro program that with an FPGA. I don't care. So if you have an idea, please let me know. Uh, you mentioned that the natural errors when you were doing error correction were correlated errors, yes. or that there were naturally occurring correlated errors. It seems like the tools you have, you should be able to do codes that can correct multiple qubit errors, you know, uh, it, just going to a larger repetition code. I would like to learn about this, yes. And I would like to learn to, to correct for more, for, for, for multiple errors if that's possible. But that's something we haven't tackled yet. So. I know there's a lot of interest, but uh, for the uh, sake of time and preserving the coffee break, I think we're going to terminate it. And okay, contact uh, me later. Thank, uh, thank Reiner one more time. <laughs> the next talk by uh, Leonard.